Thank you very much, Inessa. Uh, and I want to thank you also for your kind invitation here. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my honor to be with you uh, um, and also with the rest of the colleagues. Um, I think uh, that especially uh, this particular subject is very intriguing, uh, not because it is very much elaborated, especially applicable law issues and jurisdictional issues, but also because there, there are a lot of things coming our way, there are developments, and this is actually more or less the topic that I have chosen to present uh, you. So the, the, the uh, title is Procedural Aspects of Consumer Protection ADR uh, or Access to Justice and ADR. Uh, what are the basics of consumer protection? Of course, we have a massive production of directives on substantive consumer protection law. No need to get into details. We have a substantive uh, part uh, after the, the lunch break. Uh, but uh, um, in comparison to substantive law, we have a minimal production of procedural consumer protection legislation in the European Union. And we have the examples. First example, what, what, what Carlos uh, presented was Rome 1. Of course, there is also Rome 2 for torts and so on. Uh, then we have the Brussels Convention. Meanwhile, Regulation 1 base. And of course, there was uh, in the middle Regulation 1 uh, with uh, the uh, protection of the consumer, special jurisdictional rules, uh, um, uh, also a choice of forum uh, prohibitions and so on and so on. This is what Gabor um, presented. Uh, then Anna will present uh, the Collective Redress Directive proposal, which is actually one of, of the very trendy issues in, in international civil litigation, especially focused on consumer protection issues. So uh, the final uh, product, the final product that which is in force nowadays is the Consumer ADR Directive and the Online Dispute Resolution Regulation. This is all in all the landscape when it comes to consumer protection, focusing especially wrong button, sorry, focusing especially on um, procedural aspects. So the topic of the presentation will be to explore and present the basic questions which are remaining unanswered in the field. Uh, and have a glance also at the Consumer uh, Alternative Dispute Resolution Directive, <coughs> which is in force already since late 2015, if I am not mistaken, in comparison with pertinent national legislation. The core of the presentation, which makes probably easier for you to follow, uh, uh, is uh, uh, the Max Planck Institute for Procedural Law Luxembourg study on uh, the evaluation uh, an evaluation study of national procedural laws and practices in terms of their impact on the equivalence and effectiveness of the procedural protection of consumers under EU consumer law. This is a study which is available on the internet. Uh, you can find it. It's a thick PDF, but nevertheless, at some point, it will be downloaded. Uh, but it will be also released as a book by the end of the year uh, and it will be uh, a very interesting subject. So what am I going to present you today is uh, uh, a summary of questions and answers that are included already in this uh, study. So what are the non-harmonized domains? Uh, these are circulating among five basic questions. The first question is, do we have a special consumer forum? The second one is whether we have an exemption from legal representation so lawyer representation. The third is, do we have a special court for consumer disputes? The fourth, do we have a special procedure for consumer matters? And the fifth, do we have a special duty of the judge in consumer cases? Regarding the first question, whether there is a special forum for consumer actions, the, 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 uh, the answer is no. General rules on territorial competence, so-called venue apply which means national civil procedural rules apply. Hence, there is a difference compared to international jurisdiction that Gabor just mentioned, Brus Brussels 1 PBs, and it's uh, very, uh, I think it was a very good point because, uh, okay, Greece is not a big country, but we have uh, from north to south approximately 1,100 kilometers. So which means that uh, you can have protection from Brussels 1 regulation when it comes, let's say, to uh, uh, purchase uh, uh, f of a Greek from Bulgaria. But you don't have protection if you buy something from a company in the north, which sti from the south, which stipulates a choice of forum closed, let's say, on the island of Crete. So territorial competence does make a difference in Greece as well, and uh, is one also of the points that the study 
has uh, elaborated on and made specific proposals. Uh, then uh, th there is also difference to weaker parties. We know that the Brussels One regulation also protects workers and, and the maintenance regulation, which is outside of our scope, protects also children in maintenance cases. So consumers are not uh, specifically protected. There is a special case, which is Latvia, uh, but it's too big and I think we are running out of time, so I'm trying to uh, uh, continue without mentioning the host country. So uh, what happens if a consumer wants to bring or defend an action relating to a consumer protection dispute? Is there a legal requirement that he or she has legal representation? There is a splitting image here. You see a number of countries which consider legal representation as mandatory, posting at the same time a certain uh, level, so a certain uh, limit. So Austria, Greece, Portugal, they are uh, they allow uh, uh, legal no they do not allow legal representation so uh, excuse me they oblige legal representation over the amount of 5000 euros italy goes even uh, uh, lower 1100 euros then we have the netherlands with 25000 euros and spain over 2000 euros as you know we have also the european small claims regulation uh, some uh, countries are streamlined uh, with the amount that is uh, uh, mentioned in the regulation, some others are not. But it is not mandatory in many countries, no need to uh, uh, mention them, you can see them. Many countries do not uh, provide for legal representation, which, by the way, in Greece it's sheer impossible. I mean, with the exception of small claims, you need to have a lawyer, even in summary proceedings. <coughs> Ordinary court's competence is the rule. There is no special uh, court dealing with consumer matters. There are, for example, some specialized courts in family matters or in labor cases, lately also in intellectual property cases, but not for consumer protection issues. There are some exceptions, Malta and the Slovak Republic, which are mentioned <coughs> in the study, and also Denmark with the Consumer Complaint Board, uh, which uh, makes uh, uh, a huge difference as compared to other countries. It's very productive and prolific. What is the nature of the procedure at first instance? Is it a simplified or a summary procedure? Is there an assessment of the merits? The rule again is that ordinary proceedings with assessment on the merits prevails. Then we have exception, which are small claims procedure, boosted now by the European Small Claims Regulation, of course. And then we have some other, let's say, uh, patterns of litigation, which is a fast track in Bulgaria or in Spain, up to 6,000 euros. Also in Austria, the amount is probably horrendous compared to consumer dis uh, disputes. Uh, but there are also no special formal requirements for a dis uh, consumer disputes, procedural admissibility rules, so to say. So whatever is uh, provided for the average uh, litigant, the average party is also provided for the consumer. Then uh, an issue of forms. You are probably aware that all regulations dealing with judicial cooperation and civil matters starting after 2000, they have always annexes. And these annexes have standardized forms. Why? Because we need standardized forms also for people who are not that uh, involved in legal matters, so that they can fill in sometimes also some uh, forms. What about consumer disputes? There are no standard forms in Austria, Belgium, Croatia, Cyprus, Estonia, Greece, Lithuania, and Slovakia. There are standard fo forms in other countries, and some countries are even more developed so you can use online, uh, online correspondence with courts or email in Denmark, Estonia, Hungary, and so on. And special case is LexNet platform. We have two Spaniards here. Perhaps they can say some uh, more details about, the, uh, about this platform. But it works only by mandatory legal representation. So if you don't have a lawyer, there is no possibility that you can use LexNet. Now... This is a very, very important issue, has triggered a lot of pre preliminary references, a lot of preliminary rulings, especially coming from Spain. Uh, what about uh, the defendant who is a consumer and does not respond or raises an objection to the issuance of the payment order if the authority dealing with the claim, usually the court, uh, have the has the power to examine any issue ex officio 
or ex officio. So no is the answer. There is party disposition, but there are exceptions, and you see exceptions in Latvia, Italy, Germany, Romania, Slovenia, and the initiator is Spain, according to Article 815, Paragraph 4 of the Spanish Code of Civil Procedure. <coughs> then, if the assessment of a consumer protection issue has not been possible at an earlier stage, is it always possible, ex officio, or if the consumer raises a possible violation of consumer protection law, for this assessment to be undertaken during enforcement proceedings? The answer, the majority of member states answer no. There is a res judicata barrier. So we cannot, we cannot uh, examine the matter in this particular stage. But there are examples, uh, sorry, exceptions, and the exceptions are five countries. And especially in my country, we use a general rule from the civil code, Article 281, which is the abuse of law, the abuse of process rule, uh, which grants uh, significant uh, um, benefits and advantages to the consumer. Now, the second part, which is wrongly written here as the first part, so it's the second part, uh, harmonized domains. What are the harmonized domains? I mentioned them already. It's the consumer ADR directive and also the consumer ODR regulation. I'm not going to say anything about the online dispute resolution regulation. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about the ADR directive. So the question is, oh, do we really think it's a, a harmonized domain? Not that much is the answer, and this is the answer, like I said, of the Max Planck Institute study, which uh, uh, gathered 27 different experts from all 28 different experts from all member states, uh, and uh, uh, have uh, uh, presented these conclusions. So, CDR, consumer dispute resolution systems, demonstrate considerable differences in their domestic architectures and modes of operation. And the national differences between the member states produce broad variations in practice. So, uh, in every member state, I jump to the second conclusion, consumer ADR should be available since implementation of the directive in July 2015. In some, some countries, especially Central and North Europe, uh, CDR systems are very well established and it uh, has been developed as the mainstream procedure for C2B, consumer to businesses disputes, with while courts are basically not used for consumer trader disputes. In other states, from Sedna to South, CDR is hardly available. Uh, schemes have not yet developed, or they exist but only nominally, and are almost unknown. So. The only, uh, only the courts and possibly mediation might exist. So a harmonized EU approach to CDR is only just beginning. The statistics indicate that civil procedures li are little used for cross-border consumer trader claims in the North. And there is evidence that consumer dispute resolution is an increasing phenomenon. But the number of contacts and complaints to ECC offices has risen steadily over the last decade. So there is a, a steady increase, more trust to the European consumer centers around the member states. But there have been, had been already some national patterns. I will run through those patterns. So there is this uh, pattern of con conciliazione paritetico. I don't speak Italian, but I think this is the right pronunciation. So they had this uh, method of ADR before the Consumer ADR Directive. And in Central Europe, uh, a number of regulatory authorities have operated complaint resolution schemes for consumer trader disputes. In most Central and East European uh, states, I think Egle mentioned this yesterday, consumer trade complaints are examined by public uh, regulatory consumer or sector authorities, the Bank of Lithuania. In contrast, in each of the Nordic states, separate CDR systems or entities were created up to 40 years ago. And this is something for, for those of you who uh, have dealt or have read about mediation. We think that mediation is a new thing, but in many countries, especially in the North, mediation has worked very well, very well since the 70s, perhaps. 
not since the directive uh, was uh, was published in 2008. <coughs> now we have some other examples. We have uh, uh, this commission, which I don't dare to pronounce, in the Netherlands. We have consumer arbitration schemes in UK, Spain and Portugal, and also a model involving sector ombudsmen, United Kingdom, Belgium, Ireland, Germany, and in some limited form also in France. I skip some uh, uh, transparencies in order to finalize my presentation by focusing on three, ma three main questions dealing with uh, consumer ADR. The first point, are we talking about mandatory or non-mandatory consumer alternative dispute resolution? This is a vital question. So given the different approaches in member states on whether ADR systems should be binding or non-binding, the consumer directive refrains from mandating either approach as standard. This is exactly what the European Commission or the European Union generally has done also for the mediation directive. In the mediation directive, you will not find any statement about the compulsory, compuls compulsory character of mediation. You see probably a suggestion or a recommendation that, okay, they are tolerated, they are accepted as schemes, but we will not impose them. You know what happened perhaps in Italy some years ago, seven years ago? All hell broke loose. There was a constitutional uh, recourse about, about uh, the compulsory character of, of mediation. There are already two uh, or more, three, uh, preliminary uh, 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 references which led to uh, decisions of the European, of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, so a mandatory, a mandatory nature of, of ADR is a very tricky subject and uh, uh, the next victim, so to say, will be Greece because we have established mandatory mediation since uh, May this year. So two issues need to be distinguished in considering this question. The first point is whether a consumer or a trader must use an ADR procedure and is barred from using a court or any other type of procedure or any other type of procedure, not just court. And the second point is whether one or both parties must use an ADR procedure before using some other procedures such as court proceedings. So will ADR bar access to the remaining solutions, possible solutions? The predominant position across member states is that ADR is currently non-mandatory for consumers and often not mandatory for traders either at all or before accessing court. But we need to respect also the right of access to a court in Article 6 of the European Court of Human, uh, of the European Convention of Human Rights, which is the core element of the right to judicial protection. Like I said, special case Italy with mandatory mediation, and I skip also the references to the, to the judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union. We had the Alassini case, which is uh, actually the, 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 the birth, so to say, of the question in Europe. And uh, lately, this year, we had the Rampanelli case about the uh, nature of mandatory mediation. And there is a huge list of requirements about uh, mandatory mediation, whether it is allowed and under which circumstances uh, it is allowed. So this is a good lecture for you. Um, I'm coming now to the second question, which is equally important. The issue here is whether ADR entities can or should issue binding decisions and whether they can enforce them themselves. As you can imagine, this is very important because if you have a consumer dispute resolution board with non-binding judgments, then one party, the reluctant party, will never abide by it. If it is non-binding, why should I bother? Let him go to court. Let him spend another three years paying. So this is very important, at least from the practitioner's point of view, which where I belong. So the ADR outcome will be legally binding in three circumstances. The first, circumst the first uh, requirement, if there is a settlement agreement between the parties, if a binding arbitration award is issued, or if statutory law provides that the result will be binding on one or both parties. Of course, there are 
a lot of extra requirements, which again I will skip, and I will go to the last, uh, to the last um, hot topic, so to say, of consumer ADR, the review of ADR decisions. So let's say we have a decision, but is it possible that one of the parties might go to courts in order to quash this decision, to annul this decision? This is again not, not very clear, it's a bit vague. Uh, um, I don't think I have the time to give an answer. I jump to the conclusions. So there is no equal level. This is the, uh, the, the result of the study. There is no equal level of procedural protection among member states. There are difficulties in the implementation of the Court of Justice of the European Union, like I said, and I think Javier will talk about it. Many judgments of the European Court of Justice came from Spain, from Spanish courts, uh, and, and gave very important 